<laughs> I knew it was coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi there, honey. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing okay. Are you ready to learn about Jesus being born? Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm I'm ready to hear the good news. The good news uh -huh. of Jesus Christ. Yeah. The word. Uh, the, the bird, bird, bird. Bird, bird is, is the word. word. Bird, 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 bird. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, anyways, uh, so today, uh, we're gonna be talking about that. But last time, um, we introduced. Jesus and discussed his genealogy. We also discussed how the authors of the Daily Bible were going to be bullshitting us. And that's going to be continuing today. So rude. I know. They are fucking rude. Um, but anyways, today we're going to start with the birth narratives of Jesus. Um, and instead of presenting them honestly, the Daily Bible authors are going to bullshit us on how these stories work together. We all know Mark was written first. And even before that, we have Paul writing neither of which discuss the birth of Jesus. Mostly, we'll be looking at Luke's version of Jesus' conception and birth while cherry-picking from Matthew's gospel to get Joseph's perspective on God knocking up his wife and effectively turning him into a cuckold. Not trying to kink shame or anything, but that's just what happened. God doesn't allow Mary the choice of bearing himself as her child. Make sense of that, please. That's also rude. Yeah, uh, she's just voluntold to do it. Literally no consent was involved in this process whatsoever. Uh, Luke invents some bullshit census that never happened as a reason why Jesus was born in Bethlehem instead of Nazareth. Uh, and the authors are going to try to date these events in time because, you know, we're doing this chronologically. Uh, but they're going to fuck it up like they do everything else. And we're going to close out with a witch who drops to her knees praising Jesus in baby form. The end. Yeah, it's a it's a Jewish witch. Fun. She probably planted the space lasers up there to um, light California and France on, uh, France on fire. Mm. Uh, we'll have to consult Marjorie Taylor Greene for that particular bullshit. Yeah, you should probably get to her quick. She might go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, anyways, that's for the that's for the mafia podcast. Okay. All right. I'll save it till then. <laughs> all right. <laughs> What's up, heathens? How, How y'all doing? doing? So, um, I'm going to let, uh, you know, Casey do the Bible reading and everything like that. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, heavily invested in this, uh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so We're finally to the Gospels. Uh, yeah. I know the, you've been waiting for this for five years. I have. Uh, because, I mean, it's, it's interesting how they actually uh, tackle the Gospels mm -hmm. and how they try to mesh them together. And so, I want to, my goal, at least for the gospel section and probably Paul's section is to provide, um, I guess just an outside perspective to the whole narrative of the good word or the, what the message of Jesus or whatever, Okay, like the story of Jesus. I, I hoping I'm hoping to show everybody how this story of Jesus as it's presented in the Bible is just, um, all pulled from either pagan sources or old Testament stuff, or it's just fucking made up. All right. So, I mean, I feel like, I feel like it's warranted to say some of it's made up. Mm -hmm. If there are any Christians listening, this is me saying I'm here to fuck up your faith. No, not <laughs> really. No, sorry. I'll take that back. I regret that. <laughs> I'm not trying to screw anyone's faith up. Just trying to get people to think outside the Bible. Uh, 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 yeah, outside the, the box yeah, and, yeah. and Bible. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, are you about ready? Oh, I'm definitely ready. Okay. So in time, we're situated um, uh, not at an exact year, right? Uh, sometime between uh, six and four BCE. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, approximately 750 years ago is when Rome was founded, right? Approximately. Yes. All right. So um, we're going to run into some translation things, which we're going to, there's a couple of footers in here I want to hit where it talks, it gives you a translation from the Greek. But if you think about these people, they were Jews, right? Mm -hmm. Mary, Joseph, they're Jews. Um, uh, John, Elizabeth, right? All these people, uh, Zechariah, um, they're all Jews. So they probably spoke Hebrew when one thing. I. Uh I mean, probably, maybe. Um, the actual people probably would, although... It at the point in time in which the um, all of this was happening, like one of the major languages was Koine Greek. So, um, it, I mean, they, they could well, have been bilingual. Well, sure. Yeah, because, I mean, we dealt with um, the Hel Hellenistic mm -hmm. transition and, and what how that affected the Jews and stuff like that. And, and language was certainly part of that. Right. And uh, to be specific, there's a, bit, there's a bit of nuance here when we start talking about like 
languages and stuff because there's what was common to the writers of the Gospels, which is what we're reading, mm -hmm. and then what would have been common to the Jewish community at the turn of and the And that's what I'm talking about. The people who were in the story, not the writers. Right. Yeah, I'm talking about the people who would actually be in the story. So I was just, I wanted to start out, think, think from that perspective because the writers are writing a different perspective many years later, mm -hmm. decades, decades later. Um, the writers are writing. So it's from a different perspective. And you have to think about the people who are in the story from how that would have operated, not necessarily from how, what the writers are saying. Right. Okay. All right. So let's see where are we? We're going to talk, we're going to start in Luke chapter one with John's birth being foretold. Uh, John the Baptist. Okay. Right. So are you ready? As ready as I'll ever be. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive as they were both very old. We don't right. know how old. Hmm? Oh, I was just acknowledging that. Yeah. Uh, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. I mean, I would be too. It doesn't describe the angel here, but we've had descriptions in the OT of angels of God and they are fucked up. Yeah, which I'm wondering if there's like some kind of difference in the types of angels and their descriptions, because like when it describes or when it talks about the angels here, they kind of act like they're just normal people, which has been a description of angels or divine beings in the mm -hmm. Old Testament, uh, which is actually where they're pulling a lot of these descriptions from all throughout the Gospels. Uh, so, I mean, it's it, it could be one way or, or the other. I don't know which. Uh, I like to think of it, him seeing something that comes down with like five billion eyeballs <laughs> that would that would be crazy i'm yeah. gabriel really you look exactly like michael <laughs> <laughs> i mean i can't tell you all the fuck apart <laughs> also i can understand how y'all see every fucking thing yep mm -hmm. <laughs> do not be afraid zechariah oh sorry the angel said to him mm -hmm. do not be afraid zechariah your prayer has been heard your wife elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to call him john he will be a joy and a delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the lord he is never to take wine or other fermented drink and he will be filled with the holy spirit even before he's born <laughs> so he's not allowed to drink anything that's fermented right no wine no beer yeah he's never allowed to get drunk which kind of sucks i mean it's weird you know, i mean if uh, people want to be sober i mean that's perfectly fine fine i just i hate the idea of like some asshole from you know the celestial realm coming down being like hey he can't get drunk but why like they never give any reason it's just he's not allowed to have ever a fermented drink why the fuck not like and, i don't know that just seems it seems very random to me and yeah. like a very unimportant thing i don't know i guess just to make him different from everyone else was that the thing to set him maybe to set him apart or maybe it's because john the john the baptist is supposed to prepare the way for jesus yeah we're getting to that and may, maybe it has something to do with like the fact that you know noah he got fucked up on fermented wine and shit and that that caused a bunch of fucking uh, <laughs> jesus could drink wine i mean jesus turned water to wine and john so i don't know why th this particular thing's all that special although this is um this is luke's gospel and the entire point of going through john's like uh conception and birth and all this other stuff mm -hmm. right here at the beginning is because luke uh envisions jesus as the new elisha and elisha so like john would have been one of them and jesus would have been the other Yes. And we're actually going to talk about that. Oh, okay. It's in here. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to jump the gun. No, you're right. Um, so he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord, their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Yeah. So see, this is a big reason why the gospels have very different um, birth narratives you know, between Luke and Matthew. 
So the, the thing is, is that Luke um, is highly coveted by Christian apologists as being more accurate, I guess, just because of how Luke starts out. We already kind of discussed how Luke tries to start out like it's an orderly account or like a history yeah. type thing, but it's not. Uh, so right here, it tells us that, you know, Luke is envisioning John as Elijah and I guess Jesus as Elisha, mm-hmm. although Jesus does things that both Elisha and Elijah do. Um, but um, so the while Luke's gospel is sort of envisioning Jesus playing this role in the new Elisha, new Elijah, um, Matthew uh, doesn't necessarily have that. Well, Matthew does copy like the prophet miracles from mm-hmm. Elisha and Elijah in a lot of places, which we'll touch on later. But Matthew's gospel, as we'll see, uh, not not this week, but next week. Is, We're going to get into Matthew's gospel this week. Well, a little bit, but yeah, but not the birth story in Matthew. Um, that's gonna. Uh, that's actually coming next week, if I'm not mistaken. No, this. This week, okay. Mm-hmm. Maybe I, I. I apparently skimmed over that, and I did. I didn't listen. Oh wait, sorry. We've got Luke's birth. Sorry, hold on. We've got Luke's birth narrative. Luke. Yeah, we. Sorry, we've got. Well, we've got a little bit of Matthew in here, but mostly Luke's birth narrative is this week. Right. Yeah. So, uh, like, like I was saying, Matthew's uh, whole vision of Jesus is a new Moses, and I'll get to uh, when we discuss Matthew's birth narrative and and how that um, pair uh, mirrors Moses's birth narrative and all that. We'll talk about that then. But the the big the big thing here is to know that the reason why they're going through Luke first is because Luke has a lot of extra stuff. That is specifically because he envisions Jesus and John as the new Elisha and, and new Elijah. But that's also why you cannot, like the authors are trying to do, mix these two accounts together because they're just totally different. I'm, I know I rant. I'm sorry. I'll let <laughs> okay. you continue. Uh, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Ah. Making him a mute until his kid's born? Yep. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision for in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When this... Oh, I was just going to say, do you think these are like, you know, the sign language, like um, not American sign language, obviously, but I guess it would have to be whatever kind of like local I have sign no language. Idea. It's like, mm, God, fuck me <laughs> in the throat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife, Elizabeth, became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Apparently, that's... That's how women, one way of many that women get disgraced in front of the people is they're childless. Oh. And it's disgraceful as a well, woman. Yeah, uh, uh, because, I mean, obviously the only reason women are around to procreate yep. and gather water maybe. <laughs> okay. In the sixth month, so we know five months she's holed away, right? Yeah. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Y- you know what this kind of reminds me of? Hmm. This kind of reminds me of, oh, was it Ruth? Maybe there was there was one book in the Old Testament that was all about one girl and it's the king sent forth his eunuchs to go and find like a wife and like they found a lot. But I believe it was Ruth that was one of them. I think it was Esther. Esther. Maybe maybe it was Esther. That that sounds like this Uh, because, you know, you got God. He sends forth his, I I guess, angel, his angel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um and, and, you know, ah, the, the king has found a favor with you, young lass. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to inhabit thy body. <laughs> but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Here's, here's what I don't understand. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, you will. It, it talks about how he's, she's found favor with God. You will conceive and birth the son to you, um, and it talks about all of this as if 
you know, she's just going to get pregnant the normal way, you know, by, by Joseph, whose lineage goes back to David. And, you know, he, it, Jesus is going to be the son of De- or his father, David. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and everything like that. Like none of this screams God's going to impregnate that butt. Well, I don't know. We haven't. There, There is a line that kind of makes it seem like God's going to do it. Oh, I know. Well, but uh, my point is, is that right now, like in the conversation between Mary and the angel. Sure. Every- there's nothing to say that you will conceive Abbott as a virgin. Just you will conceive and give birth to a son. Yeah, well, and the reason I'm highlighting, this is very important as far as the construction of the whole virgin birth idea, because it, it literally makes no sense the way that it's constructed. Well, it also says God will give him the throne of his father, David, and mm-hmm. Joseph's lineage supposedly is David. So, right. so mm-hmm. is there is no indication here that the that the conception is going to be bracket. Right. Um, okay. Uh, how will this be? Mary asked the angel since I am a virgin. Why would she even ask this? Well, I, uh, because uh, she's obviously not married yet, mm-hmm. but if she's betrothed to be married and an angel ma- it makes the whole trip down here from heaven mm-hmm. and says, Hey, you're going to have a kid. She's like, <gasps> but how could that be? And I'm sure the angel's like, is the dude a fucking eunuch or something? Like, <laughs> did he get his balls cut off? Like, obviously you you'll get fucked and you'll have a kid. Like I feel, feel like at the, like there's no reason for Mary at this point to, to be ask like, the question. Yeah, to ask it. Like, it would it seems like a bizarre question to ask. Well, it does. If if this was a real conversation that happened and obviously th- there's an obvious reason why she asked the question which we're about to get into. The angel answered, "The Holy Spirit will come on you." Ew. <laughs> fucking shoot it somewhere else <laughs> i'm pretty sure she has not consented to this no <laughs> no uh, exactly uh, try not to get it in her hair <laughs> <laughs> i hear that's hard to get out <laughs> have you seen uh, uh there's something about mary a long time ago. Um, so the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month for no or no word from God will ever fail. So <clears throat> Mary is obviously surprised, right? Well, she's. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. And she says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be to me be fulfilled and then the angel left her now there are some people that want to say that this part right here specifically is mary giving consent but i mean at at no point did the angel what was the angel like will you do this for us i mean will you Uh, come on no (laughs) so i mean mary just accepting what's gonna happen is not consent also she's probably very young yes uh (laughs) i think a lot of people date her or date her age to be like around 14 or so like when this would have supposedly happened, considering like when it was normal for yeah, you know, I mean, I guess societally at the time that wouldn't have been considered bad. Now that would be not good, <laughs> right? Uh, but I, I, I do want to draw like um, particular uh, attention to how uh, how how close all this is to like things that have already happened in the Old Testament. Like if we just take John's uh, the uh, John the Baptist. I mean, it's quite similar to Isaac. Yeah. Because Isaac was born of Abraham and Sarah. Who Sarah was incredibly old. You know, uh, uh, Abraham was blowing dust. I mean, <laughs> the, the, it, it seems incredibly similar to that. And then, of course, you've got the ultimate miraculous birth of the Holy Spirit <laughs> unloading on Mary. Um, and somehow that is going to uh, get her pregnant, uh, which I believe where they get just to let you all know where they get this whole idea of a virgin birth is actually a misunderstanding from Isaiah, uh, because in Isaiah, um, it talks about um this a, a virgin or, or a young girl is how it's actually understood. A young girl will conceive and birth a child and they misinterpret it to mean virgin, you know, from the Old Testament. And um, in, in context of the Isaiah passage, it's actually talking about the state of Israel and everything like it's it's symbolic of Israel. Um, and it's not 
literally about a virgin birth. But uh, as we can tell, the New Testament authors, they have misinterpreted this in their hopes to reinterpret things to be more messianic, uh, messianic, whatever, uh, to be about a virgin birth. So that's why you have all these connections like to the Old Testament. Okay, you ready to continue? Yes. Okay. So at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, best Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. By, but why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to see me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. So I kind of imagine Elizabeth, like, you know, seeing Mary, having the baby jump, and then all of a sudden she speaks in that, like, really loud, booming voice that's, like, actually 10 voices, like, mm -hmm. playing at the same time. And it's this... The booming voice that says, Blessed are you among women. <laughs> <laughs> And it's like this entire time, uh, this entire little, little spiel here. But be very scary. That would be crazy, huh? So Mary responds, you ready? Mm -hmm. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Yeah, so Elizabeth was just about ready to pop and then Mary's like, yeah, I wonder why she. I wonder why she left because if this was, she went to her in, we're guessing about six months. If she stayed for three months, she's over nine months. Mm -hmm. It seems like she would have been there for John's birth, but it doesn't talk about it. I mean, it does. It we do go into John's birth. Mary's not there, right. but I don't know why she left before he was born. Yeah, I don't. I don't know either. Uh, when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah, but his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. <laughs> and so fucking what? Mind your fucking business. An angel with 5,000 eyes all over its body <laughs> told me to call his ass John. I'm listening to it. Okay. <laughs> Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. Because, of course, it's his decision, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was open and his tongue set free. And he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Everybody was talking about it, but nobody actually wrote anything down about it. Nope. Not a thing. Not nope. a fucking thing. Nope. Okay, so Zechariah is, uh, now he can talk, so he's going to fucking talk. You ready? Well, yeah. Okay, yeah. Right. Got it. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he has said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy on our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. He keeps talking, but I have to stop for a second. Okay. Without fear? Mm -hmm. Dude, that's bullshit. Fear's like his thing. Oh, yeah. And it's definitely the thing of like Christian apologists and evangelicals and street preachers. And like, the Jews. And, yeah, and the Jews. Fear was absolutely a thing, that, as a, a tool that was used. I mean, God was basically a drunken like father figure to it the was Jews. Har he's horrible to them. Mm -hmm. And so it's like they've totally forgotten all, like the writers, the writers who are writing about this either. I mean, they know they know they've read the they've read the um the Jewish scripture. You know, they've read the Jewish scripture because they quote it. They reference it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just referenced it here, as he said, through his holy prophets of long ago. The only way you would know what the holy prophets of long ago said is if you'd read the fucking Jewish scripture. Right. So, you know, and if you've read the prophets you know that god used fear oh yeah he 
use it all the time. So this is just madness. Yeah, I, I imagine God on some days just like totally drunk and, and, and slurring his words and everything. He's like, listen, Israelites, <laughs> you're, you're fucked up. <laughs> I just have to wonder, did they expect the people who were going to be reading this to, I guess they were writing it in Greek. Do they expect the people reading this wouldn't know? What no, it, I don't think that. I think that. What, how it's portrayed in the Old Testament, I, I think that they thought that it was justified. Like, it, God's anger was justified. Like, there's no reason to fear him, even though God says to fear him um, in the Old Testament. Uh, they, like, they... they they see it as justified anger from God towards... Just, justified or not, it was still rule with fear. Oh, it definitely was, but they don't see it as rule with, with fear. How do they I not? Mean, That's literally what the texts say. I mean, if you think about like people that have been abused in these types of situations, like it, it's very common for them to not understand how this is ruling by fear. And it's like their fault, you know, they're to blame. Like he's only angry because of something I did, stuff like that. No matter who who's at fault, it's still rule by fear. Oh, it definitely is. I'm just saying from the perspective of people, like they're taught that it's not that, even though it is. So, I mean, people just They're lie told to, each other. to be afraid. Yeah, they are. How is that? Anyway, we'll just have to move on because I just don't understand it. I don't either. Um, okay, so Zechariah continues. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because, the, uh, because of the tender mercy of our God, <clears throat> <laughs> by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven. The rising sun as in S-U-N. Okay. Yes. All right. To shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. It's even though it talks about S-U-N son, mm -hmm. he's definitely talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. Uh, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. I'm not sure why he had to live in the wilderness, but okay. He was raised by wolves. That's what it says. <laughs> yeah. Well, so <laughs> this this is to be congruent with the Elijah um, imagery here, mm -hmm. and and John as the new Elijah, because that's how that that that's how Elijah is presented in the Old Testament. Um, even right down to the kind of clothes that. John the Baptist wears. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same as Elijah's clothing. Okay. So. All right. So we're going to step out of Luke for a moment and go into Matthew um, chapter 1, 18 through 25a. And we're going to talk about uh, Joseph being told of Mary's, uh, Jesus's conception. Right? right. And that's because Luke's gospel does not have this at all, even though it's an orderly account. <laughs> this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. Sure it is. Um, his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. It, this is weird because the way they talk about it, they're not married yet. Pledged mm -hmm. to be married. Right. Right. And then if she was found to be pregnant before, then he wouldn't need to divorce her. Right. So I this this doesn't make sense to me. But anyway. Well, also, there's already, if you remember from numbers, mm -hmm. there's already a, a thing that they could do. Like if, if she really is, you know, pregnant uh, with some other dudes. Oh, yeah, baby, they give her the bitters, right? Yeah, it could give her the bitters. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if he wanted to. But I don't know the this right here. That's is, what they should have done by Jewish law. Right. Yeah. Uh, either that or uh, had her killed. Yeah. Like there's multiple uh, solutions for this. Quietly divorcing somebody you have yet to marry, I don't think is one of the solutions that would have been employed. Yeah, that's not an appropriate course of action. <laughs> but after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. Now, here's what's interesting. Jesus is actually a Greek name. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the Greek form of Joshua. Right. Okay. Which means the Lord saves. Right. Okay. So you remember in the OT how we talked a lot about like different places were named based off of stories that they were about, like that were like, I don't know, the water well. And, the you know, it was the Hebrew word for the water well or whatever, because right. that's where the water well was mm -hmm. or some shit like that. So that happens frequently. So this is kind of following that path um, that he was named Joshua, meaning the Lord saves because he was supposed to be the Savior. Yeah. So the there's the imagery with the name mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes when you encounter a story where um, characters are named to you know communicate 
communicate some kind of message like this, mm -hmm. they're normally fictional. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're made up. Like this this doesn't happen normally, you know, in life. Like um I didn't know it, but uh my son Xander's name means mm -hmm. defender of the people from the valley. And if you have ever met my son, he is not the defender of the shit. people from the valley. He's not a defender of shit. <laughs> at least at least not right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's only, uh, you know, uh, 12. He's about to be 13 yeah. uh, this next year. But I mean, he's definitely not the defender type uh, <laughs> as far as like what uh, if you would imagine somebody being called defender of the people from the valley like that. <laughs> Anyways. Um, but yeah, so that uh, I feel like this is this is very clever naming um, and it's to communicate a theological message. Sure. Um, so all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, this is in Isaiah 7, 14. Okay. Yes, that's what I was going to I was going to try to bring that up. Yeah, uh, because this, the that's that misinterpretation that I was talking about. Earlier. Yes. So, but here's the here's the weird thing. They will call him Emmanuel. A mean Emmanuel means God is with us. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus, the Greek form of Joshua, means the Lord saves. So they don't even mean the same thing. The Lord saves and God is with us are different words. <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, but again, it's to you know communicate theological messages because right? the whole idea of God being with uh, the people physically on Earth and then He is going to save. Sure. Sure, my point is that they're saying this fulfills what the prophet said, and it does not because it's not the same fucking name. It doesn't even mean the same thing. Right. I, I know. Not in any translation. Well, and there's there's that problem, but there's also the problem that the actual words that were used in, in Isaiah mm -hmm. uh, mean young woman, not virgin. Although you can make a reasonable inference that young Jewish women were virgins. I mean, I'm not even talking. I'm talking about Jesus' name. Oh, I know. I'm saying that that's a problem, but there's also the mistranslation problem. Yeah. Just saying. So I just think it's interesting. This is there are other areas where people have said where in the Bible where it, it's said that this fulfills something else, but it actually doesn't do that. Um, so it's I, I don't understand why they say something's fulfilled when it's not the same thing that the same the thing that they say will happen is not what happens. Right. So I don't get it, but whatever. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate the marriage until she gave birth to a son. Now, I love this passage. You want to know why? Why? I grew up Catholic. And according to Catholics, Mary was not only a virgin when she conceived Jesus and had Jesus, but according to Catholicism, Mary was a perpetual virgin. Yeah. The Bible, the gospel in, in Matthew literally says, did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, which mm -hmm. indicates that they consummated the marriage after she gave birth. To, there's no reason to say until right. if it doesn't mean that she they did consummate the marriage. Mm -hmm. But Catholics fully believe that Mary was a perpetual virgin. Yep, I know. I, I don't I don't understand why they think that. I don't either. Uh, especially with, uh, I guess, more evangelical or Protestant apologetics, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, of course, you know, the uh, perpetual virgin thing was around for thou uh, at least a thousand years before, you know, Protestantism came up. But, um, you know, how they argue about, you know, uh, Jesus and, and how he has brothers is that, you know, they're half brothers because. You yeah, know, that's how Catholics get around it. They're Joseph's kids. Right. Not Mary. Well, the the uh, evangelicals claim that Mary had kids with Joseph. The evangelicals do. The right. Catholics do not. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, they get around even even if they they um are fine with the idea that Jesus had siblings, but they were half siblings according to them. They they were Joseph's kids, not Mary. Right. Okay. So, let's see where Joseph woke up. Okay, so now we're going to go back into Luke. Mm -hmm. All right, we're done with Matthew for the moment. And we're going to go back to Luke chapter two. And we are currently, apparently, in Bethlehem, circa five to three BC. Yeah, that's wrong, but I'll explain here in a minute. Okay. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while uh, uh, Quirin, Quirinius, thank you, was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. I have a couple of problems with this. Okay, I want to hear them. Okay. One, when they say that this census happened was during a rainy season, and they would have never done this during a rainy season. Um, it would have made no sense. People couldn't travel easily. Um, they wouldn't have done it, right? Um, also, um, you wouldn't go back to your hometown for a census as far as I understand it. 
Is that like, no. why would you go back to a town you no longer reside in for a census? Well, there was, th- there's no record of that being a requirement for any of the, the censuses uh, that occurred in the Roman Empire. And I'm not even sure that there's an actual record of the census. Uh, well, uh, no, not at least how they describe it. There's no record of this census. How they, de- right, how they describe right. it. Right. I mean, there are censuses, of course. Mm-hmm. Like, we know that that's, that's a thing that happens. But the way that they describe it, it, it does not make sense historically as I understand. Right. That, that's true. Um, but now, uh, here's here's my problem with this. Uh, so Quirinius was not the governor of Syria between 5 and 3 BCE. OK. Quirinius uh, doesn't come into the governorship of Syria until the turn of the common era. And uh, actually, this census is, well, the only census that this could be, it actually takes place in um, 6 AD. OK. So there's a translation issue here. So it says this is the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So there is a footnote on the word while, and it says this census, it could also be translated to this census took place before Quirinius was governor of Syria. How does that make sense? If it's while Quirinius was governor of Syria, I don't know. How could it, how could while mean like, this is like a Bill Clinton, what's your definition of is? (laughs) Kind of I'm just telling you what the footnote says. Oh, I know. And like I said before, this this thing bullshits us at every single point, like when they're trying to like chronologically date this, mm-hmm. because Quirinius was not the governor of Syria until, uh, you know, far into the turn of the common era. Mm-hmm. And there's no way that you can say, oh, this census took place while he was Syria uh, governor or of Syria. Or maybe before. At, or before he, he came into it, like either Quirinius ordered it or he didn't. If it was before, then he didn't order it. Well, it, it wasn't Quirinius that ordered it. It was Caesar Augustus that ordered it. Well, OK, true. But I mean, my point is, is that it was either it was either during his reign as governor or it wasn't. And it, right. like you, you can't sit there and be like, ah, maybe I don't know. <laughs> We'll add a footnote and see if they notice. (laughs) Okay. Uh, So everyone went to their own town to register. Do you have more to say about this? No, other than it's out of time, uh, it needs to be placed later. Uh, math, they, they do this, though, because of Matthew's gospel. And we'll get into that tomorrow, uh, the next uh, podcast, I guess. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. This is another thing that bothers me because it says he was pledged. I thought he just took her as a wife, like he took her in yeah. as his wife. So he now she's pledged again. It kind of seems like they're just swapping up like his marital status. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in, his, in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields near by keeping watch over their flocks at night an angel of the lord appeared to them and the glory of the lord shone around them and they were terrified but the angel said to them do not be afraid i bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people today in the town of david a savior has been born to you he is the messiah the lord this will be a sign to you you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger suddenly a great company of the hev- of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising god and saying glory to god in the highest heaven and on earth he's to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels left them and got, had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. It's interesting that they know this. The writers of the gospel would know something like this. Mm-hmm. They weren't there. Right. Uh, my guess, uh, the way that I've heard it explained is that, um, you know, the, the people that collected these eyewitness accounts or whatnot actually took eyewitness testimony from Mary about what happened. But she wouldn't have been in the field with the shepherds. Like, my problem here isn't the story. My problem is the quotes. They're literally, they're quoting as if this is exactly what was said at the time. And there's no way for them to know this. Yeah, it's definitely told from an like an omniscient sort of like third person type of point it's of view. It's told like literature. Well, it is. Uh, it, yeah, I, I know. I get you. Um, but th- so, th- th- yeah, there's no way to know unless there were like, you know, biographers waiting there. These shepherds did not know. 
No. 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 (laughs) Okay, so let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that happened. So they hurried off, found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Magically, somehow. Yeah. I guess there's only one manger in that whole fucking town and they found it. Yeah. Well, yeah, so they they magically find the manger and in Matthew's, which we'll get to, uh, there's actually a star. Yeah. So, I mean... This doesn't have a star. Right. This has no star, no way for them to know exactly where this was. Except it, Bethlehem. Yeah, Bethlehem. Bethlehem, there's a kid in a manger. That one right there is going to absolve sins. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Okay, so now we're real quick. Now this is in Luke 2. This is Luke 2.21, but this is also in Matthew. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, uh, chapter one, uh, verse 25 B. Okay. Mm-hmm. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus. The name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Yeah. I mean, of course, both of them are going to say <laughs> named Jesus and or, he got his duck dick cut. Or Joshua. Or Joshua. Or Emmanuel, as I guess he'll be in the future uh, referred to as. Yeah. Also, I think the reason why they had like shepherds in the field come and like praise Jesus or whatever at the very mm-hmm. beginning is because of Jesus as being the shepherd. Yeah. And so he's like the shepherd of all shepherds. And so I guess maybe they were paying homage to their shepherd. Yeah, I'm not God. really sure why it would matter that a bunch of shepherds came like why would the angels tell these random fucking shepherds in a field yeah, you know well, what i mean like this is this is all just super weird yeah well can you imagine it's like the shepherds come up and it's like hey um these uh beings made completely of eyes came down and shouted from somewhere because they didn't have mouths i don't know where they shouted but they were like hey there's a dude born in a manger and so we thought oh shit we better go see this <laughs> and here we are <laughs> yeah I mean, sorry no. we didn't bring presents <laughs> We're fucking shepherds. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So back into Luke uh, two, uh, chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. That's in um, Exodus chapter 13. Yeah. Verses 2 and 12, I think. Right. Um, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Um, that's in Leviticus chapter 12. Those pigeon dealers must have been making bike at this point in time. <laughs> So they went to present Jesus in the temple. All right. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. I have the same fucking problem with this as I do with everything else. Exact quote. There's no possible way they had this. Yeah. Well, again, they would say that, oh, we took, you know, firsthand eyewitness accounting from Mary. Like, that's how they got it. They state it as a possibility, and then they assume that means that it's I mean, plausible. at least Mary was here. Yes, you're right. At least Mary was here this time, and not like, you know, just out in the fucking field with the shepherds. and Which get... we know she wasn't. Right. Y'all can't see it, but she is incredibly annoyed at this story. It's just like fucking X to doubt all the way through. Right. And like I said, I don't have a, I don't necessarily have a problem with the story. And if there was the story, I wouldn't doubt it as much mm-hmm. without the quotes. The quotes really, really bother me. <laughs> they really bother me. Right. Because there's just no way that they knew this. They're making this up. Right. Okay. Are you ready to meet Anna? <laughs> yes. Okay. So let's talk about it. There will also be a, or there, sorry, there was also a prophet, Anna, uh, the daughter of Penuel. Penuel? Penwell? That sounds right. Yeah. Uh, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. Jesus, that sucks. Um, Or, or that could be translated, she was a widow for 84 years. She's very old. <laughs> That's very old for this. Yeah. And typically... 
um, tradition at this time, if I recall, unless maybe it's not at this time because we're we're later in history now. Um, but she would have when she was widowed, she would have been married off to her husband's brother, right? right. Or someone else. Like she wouldn't have just well, been a widow for eighty four years. I mean, I think that it probably depends a little bit if she was like young and widowed. Uh, yeah, she was married and only and only lived with her husband seven years after marriage and then was widowed. Yeah, so, so she would have been young. Yeah, she she would have been. So anyway, um, she never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the ju- redemption of Jerusalem. Right. So none of this happens in Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot we have a lot of different stuff in in Matthew uh in Matthew and and so that's the end of this right next week we're gonna go into Matthew uh we're gonna meet the magi right uh-huh. right we're gonna have the magi um we are going to um there's they're gonna go to Egypt there's gonna be a flight to Egypt right they're gonna hop on a plane <laughs> and flee to Egypt um Herod is gonna be a total dick mm-hmm. right okay so we've got Herod um and then we're gonna talk about um Jesus from Matthew Matthew's perspective, and we're also going to get some Luke in here um, about uh, his life from infancy. Right. Okay, so we're going to get some of that. Um, what happened after they were in Egypt um, and Joseph goes back and resumes his um, trade as a carpenter. Uh, we're going to talk about Jesus growing up in Nazareth and that's going to be next week. I think um, they're going to tell us just, they're going to say that little more is known of Jesus's childhood for his first 30 years. Mm-hmm. Um, there is more known. Well, there's more written about, but not in canon. Right. We're just going to be going through canon. Yes, we are. Which maybe after we finish the Bible, maybe we can go through some of the Apocrypha. Yeah, I mean, that would be fun. Yeah, like the the infancy narratives would be kind of cool to read. Mm -hmm. Um, But also, so it's going to, like, it's trying to portray, this this Bible obviously is trying to portray it as chronological. Right. But as we're going to see next week, uh, it's really hard to do that with the infant, uh, with the birth narratives, because um, the Magi supposedly seek and find Jesus the night he's born. Like he's still in the manger and all this other stuff. Like that's how it's always presented at least to everybody. Yeah. And you know, they follow a star, which is the worst way to like navigate to a like pinpoint position. (laughs) You know, like it, navigating by the stars is something that's always happened. Yeah. And, and it's actually very beneficial whether you're not, na- whether you're doing it out in the desert or you're doing it on the sea, navigating by the stars is fine. But see, the thing is, is that they don't navigate the stars in order to get to a pinpoint position. Right. Well, right. I mean, certainly, certainly not in this case, Um, but they see so the star shows up supposedly the night Jesus is born. Right. Right. But they come from a long way away. Mm-hmm. And the way the story is portrayed, what the how a lot of people see it is the Magi are there the night of Jesus's birth. They present the baby with gifts and all that other kind of shit. But I mean, even in the even in the Bible, the, the Magi don't arrive until some six months or so after Jesus's birth and they have no fucking idea where he is. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like the, the story that's in the Bible is not even like the the common thing that people think like if you were to just ask a rate like a normal christian just on the street uh what about the the three wise men Mm -hmm. they would tell you something completely fabricated all right well if you guys want to tune in next week to find out matthew's birth narrative and why that does not exactly mesh all that well with luke's narrative but they're still going to try to make it fit uh then you'll have to tune in next week for that uh but for now why don't you go down below and let us know what you thought about luke's version of the uh, birth narrative down below in the comments we'd really love to hear y'all's thoughts about it and hey while you're down there why don't you go up go on ahead and smash that like button and subscribe if you like bible studies like this and don't forget to stand up and use your voice bye heathens bye y'all